Welcome as everyone is. Welcome as everyone's joining the call for the next SHP ABC Ethnobotany webinar. As you're entering, it would be great if you could just introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name and where you're calling in from. As you know, today, it, this is from the garden to the research lab, conversation with Nadja Cech, which I'm really looking forward to speaking with Nadja today. Next week, no, not next week, next month, we'll be having a webinar, which is part of the toolkit webinar series, and that's co-hosted with Traffic. They have a new platform called the Wild Check platform, which is looking at ecological and social risks in sourcing wild plants, 12 wild plants. And that will be launching that platform and really talking about the benefits of that for more responsible sourcing of wild plants. And then also really looking forward to this webinar on April 14th with Luke Manje. He's an historian who's been doing research on the history of the, the raw drug or, or wild botanical supply of roots and herbs from Appalachia. And that's April 14th. And as with all of these webinars, you can find more information on the SHP and ABC websites, as well as all previous webinar recordings. We have them both in video form and an audio version so that you can listen to them in, without staring at your computer. And as with all of the webinars, these are made possible for free support of Sustainable Herbs Program underwriters and supporters. All of this information, these donors are available. You can find out more about them on the SHP website. And they're also made possible through the membership in, at American Botanical Council. So thank you all who are members who are joining today. And if you're not and you want information about how to join, you can find information about that on, at herbalgram.org. So with that, I'm going to introduce Nadja Cech, our speaker for today. And I wanna make sure the right screen is sharing. Um, yeah. No screen share right now, right? Okay, yeah. great. Okay, so Nadja, we'll talk some about her background, so I won't go into that now, but Nadja is currently Patricia A. Sullivan, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at UNC Greensboro. She leads a National Institute of Health funded research group dedicated to studying how herbs can be more effectively and safely used to treat disease. And she's published more than 100 peer reviewed scientific papers. And I'm thrilled really to speak with Nadja today because she brings that rigorous science to the work she's doing and her relationship with plants, but also much more, much broader. Um, and so I wanted to start with that broad view and if you could talk some about growing up and your relationship with the plants. Absolutely. And thank you for having me here today. And, and thank you to the Sustainable Herbs Pro Program and to the ABC for inviting me. It's just a real pleasure and actually an honor to be here. And I've been a fan of the American Botanical Council for you know most of my life, I think, because um, I've had the opportunity to interact originally because I was part of a family that grew plants for medicine. And so that was my initial perspective. And now I'm a scientist who researches plants. So I kind of have those, wear those two different hats. And I think the ABC does a beautiful job of bringing those two things together. And I just really appreciate everything that you do. Um, and I actually wanted to also start out today by just acknowledging Stephen Poster, um, our, our friend Stephen Poster, who departed from this plane a short time ago and um, who actually had in, invited me to give this talk through Anne. And so I just feel like um, I feel his presence here. And I just wanted to say that and to say thank you to Stephen, who's a really good friend to me and a very dear friend to my family. Um, and also just such a inspiration to all of us in his beautiful botanical photography. Um, and so really lives on in that way and that we all can continue to appreciate the beautiful photographs that he made of so many medicinal plants. So thank you, Stephen. Um, so how to start out? Um, 
let me tell you a little bit about myself for, I know there's a few friends listening in today and hello to all of you, but for those of you who don't know me, um, I live now in North Carolina where I have a research group and I didn't start out there. I um, started out off grid in Oregon somewhere in the mountains, uh, coastal mountains. And actually I have a couple photos I thought I would share of that time period. So I'm gonna do that um, real quick. Cause you know, photos are always best. So let's see. Almost managed to share my screen, I think. Yes, do you see photos? Yes. yes. Uh, so, so this is a photo of, that's me in the blue dress, a dress that my mom Mage sewed for me. And that's my dad, Richo. And some of you might know of my dad, Richo, and my mom, Mage, because they have a business called Strictly Medicinal that grows medicinal herbs. And um, this photo was actually taken before that business started. In fact, what my dad is holding in that photo in his fingers, which you might not be able to see, is a button. So the first business that my parents started was actually a business selling clay buttons. And the idea was going to be that we were going to support ourselves while we were living um, off grid in the mountains of Oregon by selling these clay buttons. But um, as you know from the fact that my parents now sell medicinal plants, the clay button thing was a bit of a bust. Um, but it turns out that the plants turned out to be a better uh, source of support for us. So um, I've just had, you know, this is another photo of me from being a little girl. This is my very first garden. And my parents supported me in having my own garden. My sitting here next to my brother with flowers in my hat. So on some level, I think, you know, in my heart, this is who I am, this little girl with flowers in her hat. Um, but I sort of made a bit of a turn and entered the world of scientific research. And really that turn happened initially. This is a photo from my uh, community college days. So I went to a community college in Oregon. Here I am with my sister and our matching fanny packs, standing in front of Rogue Community College. And I got introduced to chemistry and got really interested in chemistry, which ended up leading me to go to graduate school to study chemistry. Uh, and then at some point I was offered a position at the University of North Carolina as a faculty member. And initially I had not actually had any chemistry training in studying plants at all. My PhD work was in studying how ions interact in the gas phase with mass spectrometers in a windowless lab in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But I, uh, I was interested in applying those tools to study plants and that's what I do now. Oh, I was thinking it was a different slide. Sorry, hold on, one more slide, there we go. That's what I do now. So this is my research group at the University of North Carolina Greensboro and um, just a, a snapshot of some of those of us who are doing this work. And we study plants from a different perspective, um, but we're still really interested in and inspired by plants. And I just, the slide that I skipped over here is a photo here, the last slide I will share with you in my long answer to your question, Anne, which is um, a photo of myself and my brother and my little sister sitting in front of a pickup truck full of echinacea. So I imagine most of the listeners know what echinacea is. I noticed we even have a photo of echinacea here as one of our screens. Um, but, you know, I was interested in echinacea very early on and um, used echinacea for my own um, health as a, as a child and then grew echinacea and sold it to Herb Farm to be made into, um, into herbal medicines that are then sold to others who would use it. And the money that we have obtained by growing these plants from seed and selling them eventually um, ended up paying for my first year of college. And then I also got my very first research grant, which is what's being shown in this photo, um, studying echinacea. So maybe I can talk a little bit about that research at some point, but I just wanted to sort of talk about that inextricability between the starting and where I have ended up. And I'm gonna stop share now. I love seeing that journey and seeing the pictures. Hmm. And knowing that echinacea got you into college or not got you in, you got yourself in that paid for you. Well, I mean, echinacea helped, right? <laughs> yeah. So maybe now, can you talk some about the questions you're asking in your, re your current research? Absolutely. Then... Yeah, so maybe, maybe I can actually use echinacea as an example since we were just talking about it. So 
some of the work that I did early on as a faculty member at the University of North Carolina Greensboro was trying to get at the question of how does echinacea work um, assuming at the beginning that echinacea is having some benefit to the people who are consuming it, trying to understand that at a molecular level, trying to understand what is happening to the body when someone consumes uh, an echinacea extract, which molecules are important to achieve a desirable effect, what kinds of effects are being achieved, you know, and how can we sort of have an optimal experience using this plant for medicine. And so, in that work, um, there's a challenge, which is that the model of studying plants scientifically is very reductionist. And it's a model that has actually yielded some really interesting results, the scientific model of can we find a single molecule in a plant that could cure a disease? Um, you know, some of the most popular medicines that are used in the Western model are from plants. And again, I'm sure many people listening are well aware of that, but, you know, medicines like um, Taxol, which is used as one of the most effective treatments for breast and ovarian cancer um, coming from Pacific yew trees or the, the digoxins that come from foxglove that are used for congestive heart failure. You know, we could, use, we could list example after example. And so, you know, scientists are really excited about that model of like, can I find a plant that cures a disease and then isolate a molecule from it and make a drug? And I think that's actually great. You know, like there are contexts where that's really, really helpful. And then there are also contexts where that model of can I find a molecule and make a drug doesn't work very well at all. And I think echinacea is a great example of that. You know, we don't have a drug from echinacea that's a single molecule. And yet many people still use echinacea and report that it is beneficial to them. So the work that I do is about trying to find a model that can capture that complexity of what happens when you consume a whole plant, either eating the root of the plant or making a tincture and drinking that tincture or making a tea. And presumably you're getting a whole mixture of molecules. How are those interacting and what kind of results are they achieving? That's fascinating. And then how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, not very easily as a kid. So, um, you know, echinacea is an interesting example for me because I feel like I spent 15 years and a fair amount of funding from the National Institutes of Health studying echinacea and ended up still thinking that echinacea is helpful, but not really understanding why at all. Um, and so that's just sort of an example of how challenging it can really be to do this kind of work. There's other plants that we've studied where we got much more clear cut answers. Um, but uh, what we typically do just to, to get, break down the process for you a little bit is first of all, we source material and we try to get it from a good source. And I'm extremely lucky that um, I have my parents as a source of material often. So, you know, one of the things we really try to do is make sure we're studying the right plant to start out with. Um, which probably sounds obvious, but it's very easy to end up investing a lot of time studying something that is either the wrong plant or not a very good quality sample of that plant. Um, so we need to have a sample that is of high quality and that usually what we're studying is either like a powdered or dried form or a squished up plant that's being made into a tea or something like that. And so we also want to have that linked to a voucher specimen that links us to what the plant looked like before it got squished up. So that's basically, you know, a pressed plant sample. And so my parents are great about being willing to both provide me material for uh, extraction and also give me a voucher specimen that we can put in an herbarium. And then it stays there in the herbarium dried and pressed and cataloged and photographed for years to come and people can go check it out and and see what plant material looked like that was then done for this research study. So that's that's step one is get the right thing. <laughs> um, and make sure that a botanist is looking at the plant material or if you happen to have Richard check as your dad, he can look at the plant material and tell you whether it's the right thing. Um, and then we analyze the plant material and try to capture as effectively as we can the whole profile of different molecules that are present. So not just one or two things or just looking for one molecule that might be the magic bullet to cure a drug, but really looking at as many, detecting as many molecules as we can and looking at their abundances and then 
Um, and we do that with this tool called mass spectrometry. So that was my graduate training is mass spectrometry. Effectively, a mass spectrometer is like a really fancy scale that weighs molecules. So we're figuring out what the molecule is based on what it weighs, and we're figuring out how much is there. And then we have to somehow model what it's doing. And that's the hard part. So, you know, there's various ways that people model what's happening. One way is to do experiments in test tubes where you have isolated cells or maybe bacteria growing and you take your sample and you, um, you add it, you take your plant extract and you add it to that and you see what happens. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is using an animal model, which a lot of us, including myself, feel kind of uncomfortable about. Um, but that's a way of testing, you know, safety or efficacy it outside of a human. And then, of course, there's a clinical trial option, which is wonderful. The one of the really great things about herbal medicines is that a lot of them have already been used historically for a long time. And so it's possible to actually do clinical studies. Um, but it's very expensive to do a study in people. And it's also um, really hard to tease out the mechanisms of what's happening in something so, so complex as a human. So there's sort of usually an interplay between seeing what happens in humans, either by doing a clinical study or by interviewing people who are using medicines um, as part of their healthcare, and then trying to get into a test tube and look at isolated cells and isolated molecules and what they're doing. In the case of echinacea, um, I'll just tell you that what we ended up finding, we were studying in test tubes, taking echinacea and adding it to immune cells because we know that immune cells are um, really important for uh, protecting us against disease. And we had been told based on some other scientific research, we had read that echinacea impacts immune cells. And so we were looking at how echinacea stimulates those immune cells and how different complex mixtures of molecules from echinacea do that. And in the end, we realized that what was stimulating the immune cells was not the echinacea, but um, bacteria that are living inside the echinacea. Um, so it was uh, like, just like we have a microbiome, plants have a microbiome, right? And so all these bacteria were getting squished up along with the echinacea when we made extracts out of them. And when you add bacteria to immune cells, they go nuts, not surprisingly, because their job is to react to bacteria. And so, um, the, the challenge there was interpreting what's actually happening in a person because actually your immune cells are protected from those bacterial components because they're getting broken down in your digestive system, unless there's something happening in the digestive system that's related to immunity. So it kind of became a whole complex question. Um, and then we realized that echinacea also contains other molecules that suppress the inflammatory response of the immune system. And that could be relevant also because sometimes the reason you're feeling sick is not because you need to stimulate your immune system, but you actually are having an over response of the immune system. So um, as I said, I, I spent many years studying echinacea and in the end decided that it was complicated. <laughs> um, but we did, it was, it was a very interesting journey and a realization that one of the things we really learned from that is that sometimes the reductionist models that we try to use, even if we're trying to use them in a holistic way, don't answer the questions we thought they were going to answer. And that absence of information doesn't really necessarily mean echinacea isn't working, it just means maybe we didn't exactly find out what we were expecting to find. Wow. Um, and so- That was a that, lot, I know. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't mean that was a lot. It's fascinating it's, and it's the complexity and, takes you on this whole other journey that you didn't expect that then Not at all. leads you, I'm sure, to new questions. Always. That, and, and so what are some of the things that, for example, emerged from that? Well, you know, one of the things that emerged was coming up with more comprehensive ways to characterize all the different molecules that are present in a plant or a plant extract and really considering the different ways that they might be operating. So echinacea was a great example of a plant that had some molecules that were stimulating the immune system, at least in a test tube. Um, those were actually coming from the bacteria, not the echinacea itself, and then others that were having a suppressive effect. And when we combined them together, it was all muddled. But as we could start to tease those out, we could start to understand that better. Um, so I think, I think just the realization that 
we have to look at things in combination and also in isolation and to be as comprehensive as possible about how we characterize what it is that we're looking at and to be open to going in new directions. Um, we also, we, I, I'll, I'll mention a research project that we've been involved in for many years with Golden Seal. Um, and so your, your, your listeners who are interested in the sustainable herbs problem might project might be um, interested in Golden Seal because it's wildcrafted in the US. And um, we actually did a bunch of research with cultivated Golden Seal and we found it to be just as good, if you will, and high in the desirable alkaloids or the alkaloids we think that are desirable as our uh, wild harvested Golden Seal. And um, we observed really interesting um, results with that project where we found that golden seal leaves in combination with golden seal roots actually were giving a more pronounced antimicrobial effect than either one alone. Um, and so that's an example of this concept of synergy we talk about when we bring together, you know, multiple constituents from different parts of the plant. So that's something we've published a fair amount about. I'll be, I'll be, to be clear, that's all, again, research in test tubes. So you have to decide whether you extrapolate that to what it means for people who are using these plants as medicine. And I think it's important, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not telling you how to use plants for medicine, but it is pretty fascinating to me that a plant is making different molecules in different parts of the plant that are working together to achieve um, effects that you don't see for any individual molecule alone. I wanted to step away for a second from the, ke the chemistry and, yes, and ask please. you, no, 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 I want to get back to it, but um, mm -hmm. ask how your, the perspectives you were exposed to growing up, at both directly your relationship with plants, but also the community where you were living and herbal medicine, how you think that experience has informed the questions you bring to your research yeah. and, 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 and the conclusions you draw from your research. Like the, yeah. I mean, I feel like, I, I gotta say, I feel so appreciative to the hippies for raising me with an op what I would say is open perspective to the world of being open to this idea that there might be multiple ways of knowing things and also just a communal way of seeing things and an attention to community and to community interactions. And, you know, I showed you the photograph of my beautiful research group, and we really are a community of people that are working together to do science, and each person brings to that their own questions. So, of course, the questions we're interested in answering are informed by our own background. I'm sure I would not be studying plants and trying to understand the complexity of plants in the way that I am if I didn't have the background that I had. Um, and I think, um, it's great to be able to pursue different questions in the context of the group that are interesting to different members of that group and to be to remain open to that. So I think that would be like my word of the day would be the open openness and to be open to an unexpected finding and to be open to realizing that we don't know the answers. And sometimes we work on something for 15 years and at the end, we're still not sure <laughs> what it means, um, but we learned a lot in the process, so. Yeah, I would say that's part of it. And then I think you also asked a little bit about like the different ways of experiencing plants. And um, I feel like that the research lab is like one very reductionist way of looking at things. Even if we're trying to look at complexity, it's still looking at the molecular level is missing out a lot on what's going on, including the interactions between plants and people. And so the experience of gardening is such a transformative experience for me. And actually I have a little thing I wanted to read about that if you would let me. Um, I have a little piece that I wrote about my experience gardening and pandemic gardening. And so I thought I would share that because I think it speaks a little bit to this idea of um, the plant is more than the molecule, if you will. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Okay, great. So this piece is called Back to the Garden. And I start with um, a quote from uh, our friend, Joni Mitchell. We are stardust, we are golden, we are billion year old carbon, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. True confession. I've been dreaming about an apocalypse for years now. Not the death and destruction part, of course, but the back to nature part, like sewing clothes out of animal hides and growing my own corn. 
The apocalypse dreams were my best defense against the impending existential crisis that threatened to crash in on me as I sat furiously typing on my laptop in cramped airplane seats or crappy airport restaurants, while in transit to scientific meetings in London, San Diego, or Hong Kong, crawling into unfamiliar beds in a range of seedy or nice hotel rooms, I would often pause to contemplate an alternate reality where sunshine and birdsong replaced fluorescent lights and emails. I was like the man in the Chinese fable who rescues a magic fish and is granted an illustrious palace only to end up longing for his little shack by the sea. I lived in a shack once, a child of hippies. I grew up wild and barefoot herding goats and exploring the forest and helping my parents grow vegetables. I had a pet peacock and swam naked in a muddy pond full of biting catfish. I made my way here from community college to university to graduate school, yet I never fully relinquished my roots. And thankfully, about 10 years ago, I found my way back to a small plot of land that runs along the railroad tracks north of downtown Greensboro to Dunleith Community Garden. In our garden plot, my family and I grow herbs, heirloom tomatoes, bumper crops of cucumbers, and a few watermelons that seem perpetually doomed to stay green. It's a mystery to me how generations before survived on produce from their gardens. Apocalypse dreams aside, I'm aware of the more practical reality that if economic collapse plunged us into an agrarian society, the garden would postpone my family's inevitable starvation by approximately 2.5 days. Cucumbers for dinner again, mom? Yes, but tonight we shall have them flavored with this delicious thyme. It's a fact that I will never feed my family from my little garden plot. As it turns out though, in the current situation, the garden is our salvation nonetheless. Before gardening was a solitary activity, me and the bumblebees and an occasional garden snake digging at the tangled roots of relentless Bermuda grass or moving mulch around in my blue steel wheelbarrow. It was a silent meditation, a contemplative space in which hours could go by unnoticed as I slowed my pulse to the humming of the cicadas. Since the shutdown, I've had a lot of company at Dunleaf. Plots that sat fallow for years have been adopted by my neighbors who like countless people around the globe are suddenly moved to try growing their own vegetables, often for the first time. I mostly like to garden by planting seeds directly in the soil of my garden bed. At first, this planting from seeds seems maddeningly slow. The seedlings stay small while they solidify their tenuous hold on the earth. Their spindly stems and tiny leaves invisible until you squat down in the garden path and get your eye right close up. By contrast, transplanted potted vegetables start out much larger. They often suffer from their abrupt change of surroundings and stand in suspended animation like shriveled gangly aliens, neither growing nor dying. The plants that start from seeds are like the tortoise, slow from the start, but with roots and leaves perfectly suited for the very soil and air into which they sprouted. Without the need to overcome the shock of being transplanted, they eventually overtake their hair-like transplanted counterparts. In my pre-pandemic life, I was perpetually suffering from transplant shock. Now that I've stopped moving, I can at last adjust to the conditions around me and begin to grow again. It's a Groundhog Day scenario whereby I have the opportunity at last to perfect one 24-hour period, making mistakes, but awakening each day with a chance to try again. Unlike Bill Murray though, I have my seedlings to prevent me from going mad. I inspect them each morning and am relieved to find new leaves. They remind me that each day is in fact a little different. Thank you for sharing that, lovely. And, and the description as you were talking about the seedling growing in that process, it made me think again of how you described your research with Echinacea, you know, 15 years and unfolding as it unfolds, but not necessarily as you expected it would. Absolutely. I'm curious if how your experience in the lab informs your experience then in the garden or moving in the circles, you know, understanding the herb medicine that you grew up with. Like what, what is that perspective of deep Absolutely. immersion in science? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that's wonderful is that I can bring my students to the garden and I realized that for them, um, the experience of researching a plant is totally different if you have the experience of 
seeing it in the garden and maybe being the one to harvest it yourself than if you're just given a sample of some amorphous dried up plant material from someone else. So, you know, I think, you know, we could say that a mass spectrometer is one way to know a plant, but to smell it, to see it, maybe to draw it or to photograph it, um, to watch it grow, you know, that is a different thing. And in some ways, what we're studying when we look at the molecular composition of an extract we make from a plant is static. It's capturing one moment in time. Um, but there's also this dynamic engagement that comes from um, observing something that's alive. And uh, that's really, I think, where the magic is and where a lot of the healing comes in. So, you know, it's great if you can find a molecule that does something in the body that helps prevent disease, but there's just a healing of, of smelling of the essential oils from a rosemary plant or of actually getting to nurture a plant and watch it grow or eating something that you grew yourself. So I feel like there's, there's just so many ways um, that go well beyond studying the science that are really important um, when we think about the healing value of plants. It's interesting, this tension, and there are some questions that have asked about this, this tension between what healing is in the broadest sense and our ways of understanding that healing in the lab and the reductionist approach and even the, the thinking that healing is just in a pill or a tincture even, right? That it's so yeah. much broader than that. Absolutely, this one context is so important. Yeah, sorry, go ahead with the question, yeah. Well, I was gonna read this one question. Um, this is wonderful approach, not because I think it kind of goes more specifically into this. Wonderful approach, I'm planning to use a similar approach um, or on species from the Amazon is we are able to identify the compounds in the mixtures. Why have you been working for step four, classical natural product chemistry work that is isolating and testing activity of single molecules? So the tension between identifying the compounds in the mixture and using isolating single molecules as the way to get there, I think. Yeah, okay, great question. So. I think, I think if I understand the question correctly, it's like, why would we go all the way to isolating and identifying single molecules and not just look at them as a mixture? Um, and I think the answer to that is we can do both. You know, one, one reason that I think it's valuable to look at the structures of the molecules and try to figure out what they are with tools like mass spectrometry and NMR and other things that we have at our disposal in the scientific lab is that it gives us an element of precision, if you will, we can really understand not just what's happening in a more global context, but really start to link the important players in that effect that we're seeing. But notice that I say player is plural. So I think it is really valuable to look at a mixture as well as looking at individual molecules. Sometimes it's hard to know what the players in the mixture are doing until you know who they are and what they do by themselves. And a lot of times what we see is that some, a molecule does one thing by itself, but then we combine it with another molecule and it does something different. And so we would never really see that if we didn't look at them individually and in combination. So to me, it's exciting to be able to get down to the molecular level and understand what those interactions are. Um, but I also think it's really important to accept that there's all kinds of things that we partake of in our lives every day where we don't know what's happening at the molecular level and we still do it. So we shouldn't discount, let's say, somebody's experience that drinking a cup of Tulsi tea is beneficial to them, even if we don't know the specifics of how that's happening. Um, but sometimes it's really cool to have some of those specifics. Um, and I'll give you one example. So I was talking about golden seal earlier. Um, we, one, one thing that golden seal does, at least um, in a test tube, is that if you grow bacteria, MRSA bacteria, which are some of the most damaging bacteria uh, that are responsible for infections in hospitals and also in communities now, um, MRSA infections are one of the, the there are drug resistant staph bacteria that are one of the, the highest, um, the largest causes of death due to bacterial infections comes from MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which exists because we invented methicillin. So now we have bacteria that are resistant to methicillin. Um, golden seal extracts do um, inhibit the growth of MRSA. And that's partly because they contain this alkaloid called berberine, 
which um, is toxic to bacterial cells. So the plants invented an alkaloid that, surprise, surprise, is effective against bacteria. Plants are protecting themselves against bacteria. We can also use these plant molecules against bacteria. But interestingly, the plants also make a second class of compounds called flavonoids. And those flavonoids are not directly antimicrobial, at least not the ones that golden seal makes. So they don't, they don't actually inhibit the growth of the bacteria. But what they do is they gum up the system that the bacteria use to pump out its toxins. So bacteria, um, when you try to kill a bacterium, one of the things that it's good at doing is taking whatever molecules you're using to try to kill it and, and pumping them right back out again so that it will be protected against them. And so that, um, that process is actually one of the ways that bacteria become resistant to antibiotics is they start making more and more pumps so that the more antibiotics you try to throw at them, they just pump them right back out again. And one thing that you find in golden seal is flavonoids that inhibit that pumping process and cause the antimicrobial molecules also being produced by the plant to build up inside the bacterial cells. So remember I was mentioning earlier that plant roots plus plant leaves in golden seal is causing a, a more pronounced effect against bacteria than either one alone. The plant roots that have the toxic, um, the alkaloids that are toxic to the bacteria and it's the plant leaves that have the flavonoids that are enhancing that effect. So do you need to know that to use golden seal to treat an infection? Well, the Iroquois and Cherokee were using golden seal to treat infections you know, long before we were even here and long before it was even written about. So I'm going to say we, I mean me, I mean some of you may have been here or your ancestors may have been here. I should be careful about that. But um, um, so I don't think we have to get down to the molecular level, but it's pretty cool when we can, right? Like, I think that's pretty amazing. And it also is a great story. You know, stories are very powerful. That's a great story to be able to tell if you're trying to explain why you might be using golden seal against an infection is that we can then speak about it in the language of science, which is very interesting to some people and, and one might say persuasive. I will just add one more time that I'm not telling you to use golden seal to treat your infections. <laughs> Ask your doctor or herbalist. Uh, and it's a wonderful story of complexity and synergy yeah. and all those, um, the synthesis of using, focusing on the single molecules in a broader context, what you were saying. I'm curious how, you go about deciding the, the research, which plan, is it by plants or question? Which or plan are we gonna do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that actually one thing that's kind of neat is that I do allow a lot of my students to go out and study the literature or to go out and collect samples of plants and then to decide what they're most interested in studying. So in some ways we are, we are um, following the interests of the people who are present in the lab. Um, I have interests myself, obviously. Echinacea funded me through college, so it's probably no big surprise that it was the first plant I chose to study. Um, had an interest in golden seal as well. We've studied you know, dozens of different herbs in my lab over the years, and we also have funding from the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health to do a lot of that work. And the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health um, you know, they often have specific priorities. For example, there's a lot of interest right now in studying pain um, because of the opioid epidemic in the U.S., and there's a lot of funding for that. So sometimes the funding also um, guides us. And also, of course, if there's an opioid epidemic, we're interested in that as well. So, you know, are there particular botanicals, particular herbs that are useful in treating pain? And can we understand how they're working and how they might work better? Um, we've done a bunch of work actually studying kratom. Um, which is used for pain, as many of you may know. And there are some concerns about kratom, uh, particularly when it's used at the same time as opioids because it impacts the metabolism of opioids. So you can have uh, people having drug overdoses when they're using kratom at the same time as other opioids. Um, but there's also a lot of people that report really effective um, pain relief from using kratom. And so we've got a project in my lab where we are characterizing different sources of kratom, trying to determine whether they are the right plant, um, which kinds of alkaloids are present in those, 
and which alkaloids have which biological effects. And the plant makes more than 40 different alkaloids. So most of the research has focused on just one or two of those, but um, the different alkaloids with different structures have remarkably different biological effects. So drinking a cup of kratom tea is gonna have a very different impact than consuming a single alkaloid from kratom. And that's something we're interested in. So again, getting back to this idea of complexity. So I, I, I think that answers your question, Anne. It's, you know, there's all kinds of factors, funding, interest on my part, interest on the students part, what we read in the literature. Um, sometimes I ask my dad, you know, what have you got going on right now? Are there any plants we could look at? Um, we have a plan to look at peppers this year um, because we got some really interesting results with capsaicin in the research lab from peppers. And I called my dad up or sent him an email yesterday and said, hey, have you got any good pepper samples? And he said, this year I decided to plant every single kind of pepper that we have seeds for. And I just planted them yesterday. We said, all right, let's test every single one of them and see what they do. So, you know, it's pretty fun to be able to do that. Yeah. Just sticking with the plants for a second, somebody has asked if you've studied Solomon's eel for pain or the Cherokee use mullen for lung issues if you've studied mullen. Great. Uh, we have not studied Solomon seal or Mullen, but I will add them to my list of things. To look at. <laughs> and there, this kind of continues on this same question. I think you've answered it, but I wondered if there are other um, examples. Is, is there any evidence in your research that proves that the use of many medicinal plants since the Greek era is correct? I think you've given examples. But are there any other ones that emerge that you'd want to share? specific examples of plants that we're studying yeah um you know we let's try to think if there's some favorites um let me look back at my notes um i think i had a couple that i was thinking about oh i know one i was thinking about okay so one that we were just looking at recently, I mentioned Tulsi tea a little bit earlier today. Um, some of you may have used Tulsi, um, which is the uh, Osimum tenuiflorum um, that, is, that is consumed a lot. It's a major component in Ayurvedic medicine, but also just widely used now around the world. And um, we had we were interested in, in sort of reports that different types of Tulsi are similar or different from each other. And so we've been doing a study looking at a bunch of different um, Tulsi species and varieties and comparing their chemistry. And of course, we are finding remarkable, remarkable differences in which volatile molecules are present in those different plants. But the reason I thought I would bring up that story today is that we can tell that with a mass spectrometer. We can analyze the different molecules and see different profiles but you can also just open up the bag and smell it and tell that they're different from each other. So I think um, it's just another example of like, there are many ways to engage with, um, with a plant and we should uh, not limit ourselves in how we're doing that. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a question that connects back with, I think what you've gained from your experience in in chemistry and science and bringing that kind of rigor, what, what do you see as important to teach people about plants and plant medicine more broadly sort of outside the chemistry lab? And this question continued, some people lean so hard on plant medicine for miracle cures, like mm. um, taking a pill for you know, cancer, diabetes, COVID, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and there seems there like can be a hubris in science, but there's also yeah. maybe humility that comes with science. I'm just curious how you think about this. <laughs> what a wonderful question. Yeah, I feel like I, gosh, I, the more I learn, the less I know is so true. Like it, I feel like um, it's very easy to misinterpret uh, the result of a sm small experiment um, in a more, in a way that is too broad. I think, and I think that sometimes also we find cases where people are absolutely certain of something and we study it and we find out that actually it's not what people thought after all, or at least doesn't seem to be. So I, I think we have to sort of take all medical advice cautiously, whether it's coming from, no matter who it's coming from, and really think about uh, what are the benefits and risks to following this advice. And certainly 
there are cases where people might need, you know, an antibiotic and they're not seeking it out because they're using an herb and maybe that's not great. And maybe there's cases where people are using an antibiotic and they end up with a C. diff infection, which is deadly. And that is not great, right? So like there are so many, um, there are, I, I think Kratom, I was talking about Kratom a little bit earlier today, you know, there are some reported cases of deaths from people using Kratom at the same time that they're taking opioids because it, the Kratom altered the metabolism of the opioids and people died and that's tragic. And there's 42,000 deaths due to opioids in the United States um, in 2017. I think it's 2017. Now this is being recorded, so you can all fact check me, but there was a year. <laughs> it's a big number, right? So, you know, it's very, I think there's sort of a bias in the media to be really freaked out when something bad happens because of uh, herbal medicine that people were consuming. And sometimes that's an overreaction, but there are also cases where people take the wrong medicine or an adulterated medicine or take it wrong and end up dying. So, you know, I think we just need to be cognizant of that. Um, and I don't know, I think I like your comment about humility. And I think having humility and being open to um, multiple paths is great. And I personally, you know, seek the advice of doctors for some things. And I also really believe that a healthy lifestyle and eating good food and being outside and being in my garden is really important aspect of my health as well. So that's maybe the best medicine. Yeah. It, it makes me think back to the beginning when you were talking about what you learned from growing up is that openness to different ways of knowing. Yeah. And, which brings a kind of humility, right? Because your way of knowing isn't the only one. I think it's important to have humility, right? I mean, I, it's funny, like I'm thinking about that even as I'm here giving this talk, like there's a way in which I'm like the knower who's supposed to know things. And I'm like, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> like, what do we do about this situation where, where people are so at odds? I feel like there's such a divide um, or in many ways, right? In our, in our species, we are divided, but we are definitely divided on this concept of what we perceive as Western medicine versus um, herbal medicine. And I think um, I really enjoy working with my European colleagues. Like I have um, students and postdocs who come from Europe who are trained as, as uh, pharmacists, but are trained in using herbal medicines. And I really love how they are just sort of oblivious to these um, political divides and they come in and they're just like, oh, well, in this case you could use an herb and in this case you could use a vaccine or an antibiotic and it would be great. And, you know, depends on the context and they don't seem to be at all hung up about it. And I feel like we get a little hung up because of the past traumas of the divisions that are there. Um, and so maybe it's helpful for us to take a step back and, and, uh, and practice a little humility. And it makes me think of the qualities you describe in the way you do your research around curiosity and asking questions and sort of following the thread and also how you grow your seeds in your garden. Hmm. But it's that well, kind of so, attention. Yeah. And, that's a nice, yeah, yeah. that's a really nice, a, a nice connection, Anne, absolutely. There's a nice question here from, I can't pronounce his name, so I won't do it incorrectly. Kwesi, I think, given your rich experience with plants, if there was one opportunity to ask plants a single question, what would it be <laughs> from Ghana? What would the single question be? Oh, goodness. You know, I don't know if a plant could tell me this, but I think it's so interesting that we can study science of plants and yet we still can't germinate a seed without having the seed to start out with. Like to me, that's amazing that scientists can't make a seed, right? We can grow a seed. You can get a seed from a weed outside and plant it in some dirt and add some water and you can grow a plant, right? But we as scientists, for all that we understand about, you know, DNA and RNA and, and proteins and how it's all working in the body and how all those molecular machines work, you know, we can start getting some hubris around that and we still can't make a seed. The simple thing that mother nature does all the time. So, you know, I think I would ask a plant, like, how do you make a seed? <laughs> That's amazing. How do you do that? I don't know if the plant could answer that because if you asked me like how I breathe air, I don't know if I could answer that either. But if a plant could tell me, that would be cool. 
I love that answer. And you you're, grew up in a seed company family. Right. Obviously, I love <laughs> seeds, right? I mean, I have a lot of interaction with seeds. Yeah. Um, here's another question that's someone who has always wanted to do research on different herbs and wondered, and this is, I'm asking this question because for a number of people who, who want to get into learning more about this kind of research with plants, how do you suggest getting started? Where to look? Oh, how do you get started? What a great question. Well, one thing is that I have learned that there are many people both in the United States and in the world who are doing this kind of research. So a lot of times I think people think like, oh, I'm interested in this and nobody's doing it, but there are, there are people doing it. So that's kind of good to know, right? Is that there is a community and the question is how do you interface with that community? So, you know, I think a lot of people interface with herbal schools or natural product, natural, naturopathic medicine schools in the practice side of things. There's also, a number of universities where both in the US and worldwide where research is happening on the more basic bench science side of things, which is the kind of work that I do. Um, and so I think, you know, if you're really interested in getting into that, usually training in chemistry or biology is the starting point and finding a research lab that's doing that kind of work and then getting involved in in participating in the research, which is usually something that people can do even as undergraduate students at a university. Um, so that's one option, right, is the sort of classic get your degree and study this route. And then I guess the other option would be to um, come in somehow else working in a lab without that official training. And I think that does happen sometimes, but it's probably most common that you would get some general science background and then get involved in a specific research group that's doing this kind of work. And there are groups like that all around the country. The American Society of Pharmacognosy is a great resource. And the American Society of Pharmacognosy, if you go to their website, um, has a map of all the people around the world who have um, who have signed into the map. Of course, it's not all the people, but whoever has put their name in for the map who's doing this kind of work around the world. And it's a growing map. So if anybody who's listening here does that kind of research, you can add yourself to the map. And if you're interested in finding out who's doing it, you can check out the map and see where it's happening. It's probably mostly university. That's great. And um, also for those who are interested, Cassandra Quave, Quave did a webinar Quave. with her in the fall. And she talks about she's, the same question was asked. And so if you listen to that recording, you can find out what she has. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if Cassie gave a different answer, but. I can't remember. <laughs> Check um, it out. Cassie and I are like very aligned in our interests. So it's very possible that she gave a similar answer, but whatever Cassie says, that's what you should do. Do what Cassie. <laughs> I want to take one more question from the Q&A and then I have my own last question. And then I do want to say one thing. There's a lot of other questions in here. Some are more technical. So I haven't asked them maybe you can take a look after we're done and quickly answer them or I can share them with you later. But Robin Klein wondered what you're most excited about that you see coming in natural products research. What am I most excited about? That's a great question, Robin. Um, I think the thing for me is that I'm excited about everything. <laughs> you may have gotten that. So like, I have yet to find a plant that I studied that didn't turn out to be totally fascinating in unexpected ways. So I guess if I were to answer what am I personally most excited about, it's that you know our tools for studying the chemistry and the biology of plants keeps keep getting better. And so we keep learning new things. So I'm excited to continue to do that. And I'm also excited about connecting with young people who are getting involved and who have new ideas and new perspectives. It's one of the really wonderful things about being at a university is that I constantly have fresh people coming through my research lab with fresh ideas and with totally different perspectives. And so that just keeps it really interesting. So I think, um, you know, I don't really see necessarily in the future some dramatic seismic shift in what we do, but maybe there is one coming that I don't know about. And if so, that would be cool. Um, but until then, I just love doing what we're doing, which is 
taking plants one by one and trying to understand what they do. And what do you hope, like with your students, what do you really hope that, both about the plants and the rigor of science and that sort of thing, but what do you really hope to impart to them? What feels mm. most important? Um, that we, um, that we support the, our interconnectedness, I guess, not just with the plants, but with each other. You know, that, that experience of doing research together is just such an opportunity to, um, to form bonds, if you will, human bonds, not just molecular bonds, um, and, to, and to get to um, have that experience of, of needing each other to be able to do something and realizing that we are not so separate. So I think that would be the, the most important thing is the relationships that we build with each other and also just the experience of what it's like to work in an environment which is collaborative, which is the environment I try very hard to foster in my research group um, where everybody has an important part to play and where we share what we learn so freely with each other. How do you, is that challenging to do and what can often be quite competitive settings? Um, I think it's a choice. That's a great question, Anne. I think it's a choice. You know, I think we really choose to be collaborative and we choose to be open with our information. My dad is listening because I've seen some posts on the chat. Thank you, dad, Richo. Um, and he says, said to me once, there's no such thing as intellectual property, which may be a statement that um, causes some people's hackles to be raised. But, you know, my dad loves to be a, an agitator anyway. So those of you who know him know that he's probably smiling listening to this. But I think that if we can let go of our attachment to thinking that this is ours and see it, see ours expanded as all of ours, then we don't have to be competitive because would you compete with your own self? Like we are all connected. So if we're lifting up anyone else, we're all, we're all rising. So I think I don't find it hard to practice science in that way. What I find is that if you're doing your research in a way that is very um, intentional and, and focused and that you're making product progress, it's got its own momentum and you can just bring people into that momentum and you don't have to try to shut other people out. Um, and there's enough to go around. It's not a zero sum game. So I guess that's the way I see it. And um, it's at least a more pleasant way to be in the world than seeing it as competitive. Um, and it's worked so far. <laughs> Again, I love the layers of how the echoes of what you're talking about different topics, but they echo similar to how those images when you were growing up, actually the specific in a larger world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we have two minutes left. Are there any closing comments you? I think just I'll end the way I always like to end, which is gratitude. I mean, gratitude to you, Anne, and Sahar for organizing this, to the ADC, um, and to all of you who've just been, I've just out of the corner of my eye, I've been watching the chat, which I wish I could have been just reading more carefully because there's just such interesting comments coming out. I know there's lots of people listening. Thank you for taking the time. Feel free to reach out to me if you want to have some more conversations about this sort of thing. You can find me at the University of North Carolina Greensboro on our website. Um, if you Google my name, you will find me because luckily it's an unusual name. Thanks, mom and dad. Um, so yeah. Um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, and I love the sort of spirit and energy and passion that you bring and the rigor and the combination of both. And, and from our first conversation, when, you know, we were both sharing, it was the day after we heard Stephen had died and commented on Stephen's gift was really bridging worlds through the love of plants. Absolutely. And so again, I'm so thank you for invoking him in the beginning and for his presence in, you know, the plants and bringing us all together. So thank everyone for joining and we will have this up, we'll share the recording of this um, tomorrow. And as always, all of these are available up on the Sustainable Herbs Program website. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Nadia, for your time and for your parents for joining in and everyone else. Thank you all.
Nadja, I can send you the chat afterwards. Oh, that would be great. Thank you, Anne. I would love to read it. All right. And, Take and care, the questions everyone. too, in case there are some that you can answer. There were some quite specific ones about your research methods. Okay, will do. And if people have specific research method questions or if they want to get reprints of papers, feel free to reach out to me and I can send those along. All right. Thanks Take so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.